Good morning, uh, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Marshall uh, I'm at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University uh, in Washington, DC, and also vice president of the G20 Interfaith Forum Association. So welcome to this webinar. It is the third in a series of five webinars that we are doing uh, leading up to the G20 summit that will take place in Rio de Janeiro uh, in late November. Uh, and what we are focusing on are priority recommendations to the G20 leaders from religious communities. And today's uh, webinar focuses on the climate issues, which are so prominent, and particularly on the very important and interesting experience of the uh, Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, which covers three major rainforest areas, the Amazon, uh, the Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. Uh, we have a wonderful panel uh, with us today uh, who will basically try to answer the questions of what's the problem, uh, how is religion and religious institutions involved, uh, what are the recommendations to the G20, and what we hope to see the G20 leaders accomplish when they meet uh, in November. Uh, to start us off today, we also have a short clip from Mary Robinson, who is the president of the elders the, uh, and also the former president of Ireland, who gave a very inspiring keynote address at the G20 Interfaith Forum meeting in Brasilia in August. So we'll see a very short uh, clip of uh, Mary Robinson. Um, we encourage you to raise any questions, uh, though we will not be planning to answer those questions uh, online. We'll answer them afterwards. Uh, so you have your usual uh, Q&A button. Uh, but we're hoping that this will be uh, a session, a very uh, economical se session, where we will present essentially what we're hoping to see. The event is being recorded, uh, and the recording of the event will be available um, afterwards within a few days. So with that, uh, could I ask that we show the uh, clip from Mary Robinson? Religion is no stranger to the concept of caring for our, our planet, as we heard this morning. Today, our planet is on a path of runaway climate change due to the rate of global warming. <clears throat> and let's not forget that this crisis is a profoundly unfair one. The most vulnerable, who have contributed the least to the problem, are already suffering the most. This disproportionate burden should outrage us, and we must transform outrage into action. Because if there's one thing you should take away from this speech, it is that however devastating this crisis is, we are not helpless against it, far from it. Indigenous peoples speak of the seventh generation principle which invites us to think of the decisions we take today and whether they will <clears throat> result in a sustainable world seven generations in the future. So how can we make the right decisions today? We need better representation of women, youth, LGBTI communities, indigenous peoples, and marginalized groups in the decision-making process. Above all, we need to encourage a sense of connection between all of us striving for that healthier, fairer, renewable, energy-powered world. And from world leaders, who are the ultimate decision makers on the global stage, we need long view leadership. I call on world leaders to deliver the finance needed for nature and climate, which is the focus of COP29 this year. And let me end with very succinct words of Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it is done. Obrigada. Thank you very much. So Mary Robinson gave uh, two very inspirational addresses. Uh, one of my favorite comments from her was that she speaks often these days as a global leader, but also as an angry granny uh, with a very personal stake in it. 
So welcome to all the panelists. Let me turn first to Carlos Vicente, who is speaking from Brazil. Uh, he leads the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, Amazon uh, Basin Initiative, and I think has a long experience and a very strong, uh, passionate commitment to the preservation of the rainforest. So over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, the biggest challenge is the change in the development, development, development model of a paradigm. The current model is predatory and is based on replacing the forest with agriculture, livestock, and mining. It is also based on disrespect of environmental laws, the use of violence, and the violation of the rights of the indigenous peoples and the traditional communities. This model destroys forests, reduces biodiversity, releases large amounts of carbon stored in trees, contributing to the worsening of a cli global climate crisis. It also affects the quality of the population, the quality of life of urban and rural populations due to air pollution caused by forest fires and reduced water production and supply, reduced food production, reduced electricity prices, increased electricity prices, caused inflation, increased poverty and political instability. For biological diversity and the social and cultural diversity of the Amazon to be preserved, it is essential to adopt a development model based on the principle of social, cultural, ecological, and economic sustainability. Um, this requires a profound change in mentality of political business leaders and the population in general. Without the incorporation of these values, social environmental governance, environmental activists and scientists will continue to be under intense attack from these powerful political and economical forces. To achieve these results, it's essential to improve the quality of public debate, strengthen environmental governance, combat impunity of crimes against the environment and against nature defenders, recognize the rights of indigenous peoples, implement public policies to encourage sustainable economic activities, and elect parliamentarians and government officials committed to sustainability. Another enormous challenge is the need to stabilize the increase in the Earth temperature around 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Amazon rainforest is vulnerable to climate change, especially due to change in rainfall patterns and an increasing frequency of droughts and fires. This can transform forest areas into savannas, altering the ecosystem and affecting the forest's ability to function as a carbon sink and to increase or to worsen in the social uh, situation because we have in case of Brazil, the poorest population lives in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, it's not possible to keep this situation that you have uh, the huge biodiversity in the world uh, in beside the worst uh, social uh, a, a, a social condition of the population. So the change of the economic model of development is completely urgency, urgent. We need to change this perspective to change the future of our population, our indigenous populations, and the climate and the ecological balance of the world. Thank you, Carlos. I think you've made um, a very powerful set of points of the need for fundamental change in approach uh, and the actions that go with us. Let's turn now to Laura Vargas. Uh, Laura has long experience living in the Amazon basin. She's speaking to us from Peru, I think from Lima. Uh, but the basic question to you, Laura, is why, why religion? What uh, what is the religious, the 
the spiritual dimension of the challenge that we're facing. Thank you, Catherine, for me to be here. I'm talking for Peru in a day that is really very humid. We had a lot of this uh, rain, but that, that we call Garua, and the whole thing is very, very humid. Then I have to take care of that. But for me, this is a very important opportunity to dialogue and exchange ideas about the urgency for faith community to increasingly assume a commitment to the care of creation. I think that faith communities, we all has to be committed with this immense problem that we're facing because it's affect us all. Nobody can say it's not affecting me. All of us are, uh, are affected. My feelings are that time has already run out. More and more we see how climate disasters are more and more serious and stronger affect are seriously and stronger affecting the life and hope of so many people and of all living creatures. For me, the time has come to promote a new way of seeing the life of our planet and of the tropical forest. They are not trees together. They are life six systems that we have the responsibility to care for and protect, to hand them to the future generation. Our life depends on it, the life of the future generation and all forms of life. We don't have the right to destroy what is not ours. Nature is a gift from God to enjoy with care and respect. We are living very difficult and hard time in our life and in the life of the planet. We are witnesses, witnesses of it every day. We thought that war, would, that war would no longer be a reality for our world and that the laws and institutions that we have achieved would keep us away from such scourge but we, have, we are contemplating war in real time. War also is, kills not only people in a brutal way, they also cause an enormous dam damage to our planet. The planet, our planet is being crucified in many different ways. The beloved Amazon region stands before the world in all its splendor. It leaves us spreadless. Its drama moves us deeply for solidarity, and its mystery is a call to action and commitment. And I have a small quote here from um, Querida Amazonia. Many are the trees that torture, where torture dwell. The vast and vast are the forests purchased with thousands of deaths. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Laura. Uh we heard last week very much uh, that 2025 will be a jubilee year. Uh, the Catholic Church is emphasizing that this is, as you are emphasizing, a very critical moment in time. There is no more time, you say. We've Time has run out. Um, let's turn now to Elias uh, Chichniki, uh, whose name I never pronounced correctly. Um, Elias leads uh, the Latin American uh, part of Religions for Peace, uh, which is the major global uh, interreligious multi-faith organization. Uh, and Religions for Peace has taken a leadership role uh, in the uh, interfaith rainforest initiative, as well as in broader climate issues. So Elias, can you uh, situate us? Uh, why has this been so important for Religions for Peace? What does Religions for Peace see as the role of interreligious, interfaith communities in addressing the particular challenge of the rainforest and the broader challenge of the climate crisis? And how does this relate to the G20? Uh, the group of leaders that are organizing to meet uh, in late November. Over to you, Elias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for this invitation. Uh, we are in a moment uh, of 
moral relativism, of the moral relativism, like maybe maybe than other such in the history of the world. Uh, and, it's, and, and in this specific moment that we need to fight against the moral relativism, we, like a coalition, a global, a, the main global coalition for interfaith co cooperation has a critical role to place our shared values at the center of the global agenda. Uh, the moral relativism influences every aspect of our life, including our relation to the environment. Uh, we, like people of faith, we respect and reverence all living uh, creatures uh, because they are they are vulnerable. Uh, we understand that we need to handle them with care. Our sacred texts suggest that the first human being act like a regent of the divinity in valuing uh, the life by looking at them and giving each one a name, including, of course, the the the, the, the trees and the and the and, and everything in the rainforest. We, like people of faith, we share the the recognition of the dignity of the importance of every form of existence, every form of life. And um, in our and, and of and this of course include that we uh, understand that we must minimize every human negative effect of the of nature. And for this reason we understand that uh, or we understood that we needed to be from the first moment that this initiative launched um, six years ago, the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, that Religion for Peace needed to take a, a place of leadership in this initiative. And because we uh, we are maybe one of the only interfaith, global interfaith organization based in more than 90, countries, 90 countries around the world, including the, the five countries where the initiative is implementing Colombia, Brazil, Peru, the Dominic the Democratic Republic of Congo and Indonesia, uh, we were um, uh, we, we we were a critical actor to 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 implement at the national and local level this initiative. On the other side, uh, the Interfegi Twenty in the last year. Um, achieved uh, the place of the of one of the most important annual fora to discuss the the linkage between uh, pub public policies at the global level and um, and the faith. Um, and for this reason, we support the Interfeci Twenty. Uh, at, at my personal level, it was an honor to participate in many of the last editions of this annual fora. Um, but if we go to the route of the G20, it was the um, it's it, 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 it's an, a specific uh, platform to address economic and social issues, especially after the big crisis. Uh, in 2000, in, in 2000 uh, and 2007. Uh, and, and, and we see that 
maybe the, 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 the most important enemy against the, the, the environment in many situations is the will for profit uh, without uh, conditions, without um, understanding that uh, we need we need to to build and develop that will take in, in account the environment aspect together with the social and economic aspect. Um, and, and we see in Latin America that this is the, the key issue that we need uh, to address. And the power of our shower, shared values, like the people of faith, like faith communities, working together, cooperating, uh, at, cooperating uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the public arena. It's in, in many cases, we are the only ethical voice that can to uh, bring this message to the public opinion and also to the policy maker. This is the reason because Religion for Peace take, very, take uh, this agenda like a priority. Um, um, and we, 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 we are very proof that we uh, made a, a, a greater con contribution to start at the, to launch at the national level this program, um, and we expect to continue working to strike this uh, this project in the next year. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Elias. I think you've highlighted the effort to bring the ethical voice, the shared values uh, into the broader discussion, but to take the tangible challenge facing the rainforests of the world and to link their challenge, their, their fate to the possibility of religious communities coming together uh, to make this a priority and to, to call for action. Uh, with that, let me turn to Peter Mandeville. Um, Peter uh, is leading the office in USAID uh, that is responsible for faith uh, and for local communities. Uh, he's had many other roles and hats on uh, in the past. Uh, but Peter, how do you see this in a broader global context. The G20 is in many ways about the most important issues that face the global community. There are many these days. Climate is clearly one of them linked to everything else. The rainforest is very much a part of that. Um, how do you how do you see the the road to Rio, shall we say, uh, which is approaching fast? Sure. No, thanks very much, Catherine, and, and greetings to, to all of you from U.S. Agency for International Development headquarters here in Washington, D.C. So like many of the development challenges we face, the negative effects of climate change are, are felt acutely both at the local and international level. So to adequately address, address this crisis, we, we need to make sure that we're including all voices at the table, civil society, governments, the private sector, and of course, religious communities. And I think we've already heard my fellow panelists speak very eloquently about the crucial and unique role that the moral voices of religious leaders have around these issues. In recent years, we, we've seen firsthand that faith-based organizations and religious leaders are well positioned to lead the charge in educating their constituencies on the importance and need for climate action. From Pope Francis's Laudato Si to the 2015 Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, all major world religions have to some extent addressed the moral imperative for environmental protection and called on their communities to take action to combat climate change. As we face growing transformation um, in the information space, the, 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 the surge we see today in misinformation, disinformation, climate denialism around the world, religious voices are critical to combating climate skepticism and motivating collective action. That, that's, that's that moral imperative again. 
Of course, these critical communication channels also work both ways, allowing religious leaders to communicate the specific needs of their communities to policymakers to inform better programs and practices. And here I think, Catherine, we're, we're kind of tracking towards that question of where religious voices fit into large scale intergovernmental uh, processes like the G20, which I'll touch on in, in a moment. Turning towards or, or sort of looking in the mirror, let me put it that way, as donor institutions, we also need to listen to, engage with, and resource faith-based organizations and religious communities so that our collaborations are both effective and built to last. USAID has been working with faith-based organizations literally since we opened our doors in 1961 in order to implement our programs. And we have had a dedicated center, the one that I have the privilege of, of, of leading today, focused on those faith-based partnerships since 2002, so for more than 22 years now. And last year, we released the U.S. federal government's first ever policy um, uh, on working with faith-based organizations and religious actors uh, to achieve our shared goals. Um, in terms of our work on um, uh, climate action and the intersection with faith-based organizations. Um, this is something that USA by now has a very well-developed portfolio in. Mm, Peru, Madagascar, the Dominican Republic are just three settings, for example, in which USAID have partnered specifically with faith-based organizations to address climate change. But, but Catherine, to really engage with your question, what, what, what does that, that springboard to action, particularly at the multilateral level, look like? Well, by now, in every major faith tradition, we have some form of green or e ecological movement that, that is well-developed and, and active. We have also seen the emergence in recent years of very vibrant um, interfaith spaces of, of climate action, um, of voices from different faith traditions coming together to affirm their shared commitment to protecting the planet. But the climate crisis is multifaceted, and we know that faith-based organizations can't do this important work alone. So we think it's essential that faith-based environmentalists work in partnership with their like-minded peers and counterparts in the broader civil society space and the private sector to scale and maximize the impact of their voices. The United Nations Faith for Earth Coalition, which has run out of the, the UN Environment Program, I think offers an interesting model for how faith leadership can make a significant impact towards promoting values-based perspectives and environmental sustainability. The coalition is not only increasing global knowledge about the climate crisis by using religious texts and scientific evidence, but also encouraging their own faith communities to integrate green practices into their operations, assets, and investments. The Faith for Earth Coalition also demonstrates the importance of including religious perspectives and experiences as part of the broader multilateral policy conversation. Um, USAID is committed to connecting faith-based organizations with partner governments, multilateral institutions, and other partner organizations in the civil society sector to ensure we have the strongest and broadest coalition possible to pursue climate action. So that, I think, is something that we need. To, to find those bridging mechanisms that will allow faith-based champions for combating climate change and protecting the planet to work in concert and scale their impact alongside um, uh, their, their, their peers in other sectors. When it comes to the G20 process, one incremental way that I think we might think about approaching this, Catherine, um, is for the Interfaith 20 group uh, that you've played such a crucial role in creating and leading over the last 10 years to, to correspond and engage with some of the other G20 engagement groups, such as the C20 for civil society, the W20 uh, for women, the B20 for, for businesses, so that among all of those engagement groups, there's, there's a common approach to protecting the planet and combating climate change um, that can inform the ways in which civil society more broadly engages with the official level of the G20. Of course, the political commitments of G20 heads of states and leaders are going to be crucial, but we all know that the real work is carried out at the level of communities and, and societies. Thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with you today, and uh, we look forward to working together to address these crucial imperatives of our time. Thanks, Catherine. Well, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for <laughs> reminding us all of this challenge of building on the broad common 
agreement and the sense of urgency that Laura has uh, set forward with very practical agreement on what can be the next steps. I want to turn back to Carlos now. Carlos began, I think, with the enormous challenges that we face as a global community uh, in changing mindsets and changing basic models. Uh, but Carlos, we're looking now in a matter of weeks, very short weeks, uh, to this very critical summit uh, of the G20 leaders, where, among other issues, um, issues of finance, of where the money is allocated, will be front and center, but also the ways in which these climate issues are related to food and poverty, are related to uh, are related to peace, uh, are related to prosperity. So you have highlighted, I think, very, very movingly, drawing out of your personal experience of working for so many years to protect the Amazon basin. What, what kind of hopes do you have uh, as you look to the summit uh, in late November and beyond to the COP30, which will be taking place in Brazil following the 2024 COP in Azerbaijan uh, to the South African presidency. Uh, what, are, what do you see as major priorities for the rainforest, but also, as you've made clear, the rainforest, which cannot be separated from the broader issues of climate, environment, and global priorities? Thank you, Catherine. Those are very important questions. Um, the Brazilian government is working hard to get the G20 to approve the creation of innovative financial mechanism to combat climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, the final declaration of G20 Environmental and Climate Sustainability Working Group, the results of the meeting of environmental of minister, uh, ministers from the groups of countries concluded last Thursday had the unanimous support from the nations present at the meetings. The document included finance, financing for adaptation to climate change, ocean preservation and ecosystem services and the circular economy. Um, countries committed to promoting innovative financial mechanisms to address the climate emergency. Uh, one of the best example of is the Tropical Forest Forever Mechanisms, TFF, uh, which was one of the concrete proposals that received the support of the whole G20 countries. This proposal was presented by Brazil at COP28 in Dubai and aims to mobilize public and private resources for the conservation of tropical forest, encouraging results based on preservations. Another important point of the Brazilian proposal, which was approved at the meeting of G20 environmental ministers, is support for countries affected by climate disasters. The expectation is that the meeting of the heads of state in November in Rio de Janeiro will approve these proposals. G20 countries have a great responsibility and opportunity to make a difference. Together, they represent more than 80% of the whole, the world GDP, 80% of the world population, as well as approximately 80% of the of global greenhouse emissions. Therefore, they must help lead uh, the way in tackling the climate crisis in addition to other ongoing environmental crises. In our perspective as IRI Brazil, uh, we are very um, um, happy with the contribution uh, from two women, uh, the Minister of Environment, Marina Silva, and the Minister of Indigenous People, uh, Sonia Guajajara. Uh, they were leading uh, they are leading uh, important meetings, uh, bilateral meetings with different um, members of the, the 
foreign countries and even inside the country uh, they are leading discussions uh, explaining the importance of these proposals for members of the the federal government for members for the state government and for people from members of the um, um, business sector so i think it's very important to to um to focus on the importance of the women women in this kind of discussions because uh i think the women can, can uh, use it to be more aggregate aggregative uh, and to uh conduce a good process of dialogues so i think uh for President Lula and the other presidents that will participate in the G20 meeting, uh, I think they will they uh, will receive a very good proposals, a uh, result of the dialogue between countries and the social the civil society. So I I I hope I my expectation is the best, uh, and for the the um, the COP30. I think the result, the good result of G20 meeting can um, produce good expectations for the, the COP30. Uh, but it's important to have the, uh, the social, civil society needed to, uh, to be mobilized, to be uh, following these discussions and to uh, improve the quality of the the public debates uh, to promote these proposals to offer to um, the international leaders the social support to make these changes. I think uh, we are living a very good moment in our uh, complex and very um, um, important moment of our history. Thank you so much, Carlos, and thank you so much to all of you. Uh, before the cameras turned on, we were having a discussion that was a troubling one. Um, Carlos was reporting on fires, uh, drought. Uh, there is what is now spoken of as the largest hurricane recorded barreling towards uh, Florida. Uh, so we clearly live uh, in troubled times. And we heard that urgent call also from Mary Robinson, uh, reiterated from what she spoke to in Brasilia in August, that this is an urgent moment, uh, but one where we are not helpless. I think that was her main message, that we are not helpless, that we have the knowledge and we have the tools uh, to act. Um, Carlos, I think, gave us a very complex but moving account of the interconnections that he faces leading the effort to address the challenges of the Amazon, uh, the concern of the poverty of the people living in the Amazon basin, but also the preservation, the urgency of preserving the Amazon as the lungs of the earth. Uh, and the importance through the faith voice, among others, to connect the local uh, with the global and to demonstrate the possibilities of change. Uh, Laura gave a very strong call, which I think echoes uh, what Carlos was saying just before on the particular significance of women's leadership and women's voices in addressing this challenge, that they need to be a critical part, that it is also a an urgent crisis that we cannot wait, uh, that it is a crisis that involves us all, that is interconnected, reiterating that theme. Um, Elias uh, set the challenges for the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative in the broader work of Religions for Peace as an alliance, a coalition of some of the most significant world leaders, uh, the need to work together. And for many years now, Religions for Peace has 
had a given a high priority to the interfaith rainforest initiative as both a major issue, but also as a practical example of what the different coalitions can do. And Peter Mandeville brought together, I think, the themes of uh, international uh, governance, international priorities, but also the different voices that are represented in these coalitions of women, of business, uh, of all of the other different sectors, youth, that need to be part of it. Um, Carlos ended on a note of great hope uh, that comes from the work led by the Brazilian presidency of the G20, but by the Coalition of Environment and other ministers who have really forged some consensus agreements as they look to the G20 summit that is coming up at the end of November. So he is hopeful that there will be significant results that will reflect the inspiration and leadership of all the members of the coalition, including the religious actors, uh, and that will help us to look forward to the um, COP meetings coming up in Baku, but also in Belém in Brazil, uh, and to the South African G20 presidency that will indeed uh, take us closer to this conviction that Mary Robinson called uh, us to in the beginning, to work passionately, uh, creatively, and with determination together uh, to address the crisis that faces the world. So with that, I think we will close this webinar. I hope we have conveyed to you why the G20 uh, is important, why the G20 Interfaith Forum has a particular distinctive and important role in the global governance, and why these very practical issues that face the world's climate and the example that the Interfaith Rainforest Initi Initiative offers of the possibilities of coalition and the, uh, the weight that determination and people like Carlos, uh, Laura, Elias, and Peter uh, bring us to as we look forward. So thank you all very much. And the webinar recording will be available shortly uh, and we will send the link to all of you. So thank you and onwards and upwards.